Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. As always, yet another excellent show scheduled for you today. We're going to be speaking with Nick Redfern about government secrets, pyramids, and the Pentagon. But don't forget, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. And please do check out the Just Energy Radio website. That's www.JustEnergyRadio.com where you can find out about our outstanding upcoming programming and sign up for our newsletter so you can get that in your email keep you informed about who's coming up on the show so let me tell you a little bit about nick and get him on the air because we have a lot to talk about originally from england nick redfern now lives in dallas texas metroplex area with his wife dana he is the author of many books on UFOs, aliens, Bigfoots, werewolves, and the Loch Ness Monster, paranormal phenomena, conspiracy theories, psychic powers, and Hollywood scandals. Whew. He has appeared on many television shows, including Sci-Fi Channel's uh, Proof Positive, UFO Investigations at Rendlesham, the History Channel's UFO Hunters, and Ancient Aliens. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio from NickRedfern.com. Nick Redfern. Hey, Nick, how are you? Hey, Rachel, I'm doing good, thanks. How are you? Uh, better now than yeah. I know that you're on the air. How's that? <laughs> I guess it's always <laughs> one of those situations where the host prays that the uh, the, per- the person at the other end is actually there. So. <laughs> well, you know, I tried doing this whole upgrade and change over to Skype and do this whole mic thing, and then I tried calling you, and I just kept getting this message, no Skype credits, but I just paid for a year-long subscription, so I don't get it. Mm. So now I'm back to old technology because, you know well, what, phone lines work. Well, you know, a lot of no shows won't even let me do it by Skype. By Skype. They say, just no way. <laughs> anyway. But we're going to be talking about all kinds of cool stuff like secret and clandestine operations and hidden locations and all kinds of secret things. We like secrets. But in general, and just in a very kind of overview way, Mm -hmm. what kind of things are are being kept hidden from us? Well, you know, the, the new book, Pyramids of the Pentagon, it's basically sort of a study of ancient mysteries that are being hidden from us. That's to say... Um, archaeological mysteries, ancient astronauts, lost civilizations, mystical relics, that sort of thing. So this book's a little bit of a departure for me, whereas most of the books I've written that relate to conspiracies are sort of UFO-related and that, you know, sort of focus on the 40s onwards when the Flying Saucer mystery began large scale, Um, you know, with Area 51, Roswell, things like that. But this one sort of really goes back to the dawn of human history, um, with trying to understand and determine why and how the government has so much interest in the mysteries of the past. Well, and actually one of the things we are going to talk about <laughs> now for you, probably an ancient history book also, is the keep out because, you know, 
mm-hmm. I'm forever playing catch up with you. But anyway, oh, that's all right. Well, Kate but Kate out. I mean, that one's um, basically like a focus on um, military and um, government installations. You know, the shrouded in secrecy, like Area 51, which is certainly the most well known. But you know, um, there are countless Area 51s all around the world. Never mind just in Nevada. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's the thing about Area 51. It's like, well, it's not really secret anymore. <laughs> no, everybody's heard <laughs> of it. Everybody knows about it. So it's kind of like uh, what they call one of those ultimate oxymorons where it's secret but widely known, you know. But um, but even so, you know, it's so well protected that no matter how many people know that term, Area 51, literally nobody can get in there and really answer the questions of what's fully going on there. So. I mean, at this point, with so much attention on it, do you think anything is going on there anymore, or do you think they maybe well, moved it to somewhere else? Well, there are rumors about things being moved to Utah and other places, but then on the other hand, that would be a good tool to divert people away from the fact that maybe nothing's been moved, you know. But the thing is, you know, that the it's a no-fly zone, which is heavily enforced, with literally with deadly force, if necessary. You cannot fly over it. And when you start to get within about even 15 or 20 miles of the base, I mean, it's only 90 miles from downtown Las Vegas. It's not far away. But, um, you know, it's not hundreds of miles in the desert by any means. But when you get within about 20 miles of the base, the government and the military, they have motion sensor detector equipment set up all around, which can sort of differentiate between a person and a small animal, you know, like a fox or, or an armadillo or whatever. And... So they know if you're, you know, the people are coming towards the base. And so literally you cannot fly over it and you cannot get within about 20 miles of it. And all the surrounding hills and mountains are all now under government jurisdiction. So in other words, there's really no reason for the government to go to the big effort of moving everything because you just cannot get there anyway. So. Um but they can, you know, I've seen pictures where they've done satellite pictures. Over well, yeah, the top. I mean, you can't, yeah, there's no way to stop, you know, a satellite overflying, particularly if it's like a foreign satellite, you know, there's short, short of trying to shoot the thing down, which, you know, would be, um, <laughs> we would start the next world war probably, you know, there's, there's no way to do that. But a number of the employees have said that because they know full well that, you know, say a Russian satellite, or when a Russian satellite or a Chinese satellite's flying over because they can track their movements, that what they do, all the classified projects that might be outside, they just put everything in the big hangars for the sort of 10 minutes or so that the, the satellite is in the airspace above Area 51. That's why when you look at these satellite photographs, you see a lot of hangars and clearly something going on, but you don't see anything like weird-looking aircraft outside because... It's kind of crazy, you know, because they can track the movements of all these satellites. They just reel everything back inside when these satellites are coming and then wait till they've gone and then bring them all out again or whatever they're working on. So. I can just imagine, you know, our tax dollars at work, you know, the <laughs> satellite tracking department that's like, wait, we got 10 minutes. Wait, bring it inside. Yeah, that's literally what they do. That is literally the way it works. You know, it's kind of like... Hiding behind the front door when somebody knocks on the front door, you don't want to know, and you wait till they've gone. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. You didn't see that curtain move to the side with me looking out to see who was there. <laughs> yeah. Somebody trying to sell you life insurance or something. I mean, how did Area 51 really end up on the map? You know, mm. is that kind of a recent thing, or has that been? Well, have people known about it for a long time? You know, because isn't there a little town, you know, like Area yeah. 51ville near there? Well, yeah, there's a little town called Rachel, um, which is not far away. And as I said, um, the the entrance to um, or the border, if you like, of um, perimeter of Area 51 is actually only 90 miles from Las Vegas. You know, it's not a long way, you know, in the middle of nowhere by any means. A lot of people think it's you know hundreds and hundreds of miles in the desert. It's not. You know, you put your foot down in your car from Vegas city centre, you can be there in an hour. You know, so it's not a long way away. So people have known about it for years, but it's really only been the last 20 years that it's become infamous because it's since then it's been associated with UFOs. But, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, you know, although it wasn't widely talked as much as today, it was mentioned in the media because 
it was precisely from there where the the U-2 spy plane and the SR-71 Blackbird spy plane were developed in the 50s and, and early 60s. And also in the late 70s and early 80s, it's where a lot of the original stealth technology that went to make the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber, that was all tested at Area 51. So, in other words, you know, the base was, was specifically chosen to act. Uh, it has like this huge runway and a multitude of hangars and underground areas. And even some people say whole sections built into the side of the surrounding mountains, which are then sort of camouflaged with sandy colored doors to, you know, prevent satellites basically filming or shooting imagery of anything. Um, but as far as it being, you know, it, it was a sort of classified secret base all along. But it's, you know, up until the late 80s when the whole UFO thing came along, um, it was just then perceived as being like a sensitive military installation where they were testing radical new aircraft designs and things like that. And then everything changed. I think it's kind of interesting that it was just, I mean, time-wise by that it was really so late in the game. I mean, I guess it was really the advent or the beginning of people starting to really take notice about UFOs was in the 70s. Well, yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, unless you were sort of an aircraft enthusiast, most people wouldn't have had wouldn't have taken an interest in Area 51. It, you know, it was kind of like no difference as far as the public and the media was concerned to any other military base around the country. You know, that that's all it was perceived as, but it just happened to be out in the desert, you know, whereas some military bases are on the fringes of cities or whatever. Um, but, yeah, what, the reason why it all became so infamous was all, pretty much all down to one person, a man named Bob Lazar. And Bob Lazar surfaced in the latter part of 1988. That's, you know, sort of how recent the infamy began. And Lazar is a physicist, and he claimed that for a a short period in late 1988 through early 89, he worked out at a, a section of Area 51 called S4. And, he, and it's worth pointing out that um, the Area 51 is actually part of this huge security site, as it's known in Nevada, which extends for literally thousands of square miles. Area 51 is one part of it, and S4 was like a, a, another part of it as well associated with Area 51. And that's where Lazar said he worked. And he said he was given this invite to basically work on what was described to him as like an advanced propulsion program, which is kind of like the understatement of the uh, century, if it's true. Um, and he said he was basically, you know, sort of put under a security watch and his background was checked out and he was sort of deeply studied to make sure of his patriotism, etc. Had to go through campus interviews and all sorts of weird situations before he got this job. When he got out there, he said that he was shown what were literally nine flying saucers. And contrary to a lot of people think that Lazar said, he never said they had looked anything like, you know, crashed or wrecked UFOs, that you know, like Roswell or anything like that. He said they looked in fully. Apart from one, he said it had a very slight dent in it or a hole. He said that they all looked in complete normal working orders if they just come off the production line and and actually at first he thought that's what they were that you know the military had been secretly building flying saucers and that you know possibly the ufo angle the alien angle had been spread as a as a lie you know to hide the fact that the government was building them but he said that that totally went out of his mind when he said that he was given a tour or shown the insides of these craft and they had these little seats which would only sort of fit somebody about three feet tall. And then, of course, the, the penny dropped, if you like, and when he saw the technology involved and the fact that there was no rivets or nuts and bolts or anything on these craft, they just looked like they'd come out of like a, like a wax mold or something. He said then he realized they were dealing with something different. And he said he worked on this program for a couple of months and he was warned not to talk to anybody about it. Um, uh, but he did. <laughs> he told his family and friends and... And he was thrown out of the, of the project. But shortly after that, his security officer said, well, we'd like you to come back out to the base. We need, you know, to have a chat with you. And Laz the kind of the, you know, the red flags went up. And Lazar thought, well, if I go out into this isolated base in the Nevada desert, after I've been fired and I've seen the ultimate secret, who's to say I'm actually going to ever come back? I'm not just going to, mm -hmm. you know, his bones are going to end up buried in the desert. So he refused to go back. And he said that after that he got evidence that his phone was being tapped and he claimed somebody tried to shoot out the tires of his car and that was when he said he decided to go public so that is sort of the background 
tell us our story. But then, of course, you know, there are other issues. Is he telling the truth? Is he lying? Is he spreading disinformation for the government, or is it something else? I know, because after he came out with his story, there were a whole bunch of people, you know, that were saying, well, he never really worked at Area 51. Look, he's not mm-hmm. on any register. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't really have any degrees. How could he be a physicist if he didn't graduate from anywhere? But it well, seems yeah. like the government's pretty good at <laughs> making yeah, those mean, kind of things yeah. disappear. I mean, even Stan Friedman, you know, Stan is a, a full-on believer in the extraterrestrial theory and that there's a government conspiracy to hide the truth about Roswell. But Stan said about Roswell, uh, about Lazar, and I'm quoting him now, he said, this is bunk, bunk, bunk. <laughs> Those are Stan's exact <laughs> words. And they are still Stan's exact words to this day. He doesn't think there's anything to Lazar's story at all. But the thing is, when we look into Lazar's story carefully and, and closely and deeply, we actually find it's not so easy to dismiss him after all. For example, he told his story initially to a Las Vegas um, journalist, a, just a regular, very good news journalist, investigative reporter, um, named George Knapp. And George began sort of, you know, digging into just every conceivable angle, as he would in a normal investigative news story, to try and find as much as he could on Lazar. What he actually found was that despite what some have said, that there's no evidence of him having like a scientific background or even, you know, working on classified programs, um, George actually found, and this, is, this has been proved, uh, Lazar's number in none other, phone number in none other than the 1982 edition of the Los Alamos National Laboratory um, phone directory. Um, and it was shown that he was working on unclassified programs at Los Alamos. Now, when sort of Los Alamos personnel were approached, and they turned kind of very red-faced when they were shown this page out the phone directory, they said, well, he did work for us after all. This is after denying he worked there. Because he, he claimed that he worked there, and so Nap phoned up Los Alamos and said, hey, you know, what about this? And they said, never heard of him. When they, when they were then shown evidence that his name was actually in their phone directory, they said, well, he actually didn't work for us. He worked for a subcontractor. But he did do work for us, you know, which is kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Um, now, from there... People asked Lazar, you know, how did you get your job in the first place? And he said, well, when I was at Los Alamos, I met um, Edward Teller, the famous scientist, you know, who's responsible for a lot of the sort of 1940s, 50s, highly advanced scientific and weaponry programs of the U.S. military. And he said, Teller basically said, well, you know, I can get you involved in some even more cutting edge work and let me have a word with a few people. Now, Lazar told this story publicly to authors on TV, on radio, and elsewhere. If you you imagine, if that was, if you were Edward Teller and somebody was saying all this about you, because Teller was still alive at the time, you know, you probably, and it wasn't true, you'd probably take legal action. You know that some you, if somebody was claiming that you got them into a UFO program at Area 51 and it was absolute lies, you would you would consult your attorneys and you know just come straight down on this person. Teller didn't take any action didn't want to comment on it at all but on one occasion he was actually cornered by a nevada tv crew who basically put him on the spot and you know said is this true is it not true etc etc and rather than saying no this isn't true and i'm going to have my attorneys you know take lazar to court for every penny he's got what teller actually said was along the lines of well i don't remember his name but if i did meet him maybe i referred him to somebody on a different job, um, and maybe I said I liked him, but in saying that, I don't remember him, I don't remember meeting him, and I don't remember referring him to a job, but I might have done, <laughs> you know. And it was like Teller was trying to do everything he could to avoid answering the question, but also to not specifically say this man's a liar, which is, if he was a liar, he's very curious, you know, that he wouldn't come out and say so. Um, and there are other things where Lazar, for example, you know, his background, people say, well, he didn't study at this college or that college. Well, no, there's no evidence being found that he did. But he did work on highly advanced programs at Area 51. And one of the things that a number of people have said at Area 51 is that the, the people who oversee the, the high cutting-edge projects there don't always employ, you know, the the big names with all the letters after the names, what they look for, particularly when they're dealing with new and novel uh, 
programs is people who think outside the box are very brilliant but might be a bit maverick and eccentric and but who you know their brains are wired in such a fashion that they're so brilliant we want to get them on board but you know but they don't necessarily need to have this background or that that background you know and you could argue that in many respects Lazar fitted that bill you know he was sort of a maverick scientist who built jet cars that could you know travel at like 150 mile an hour across the Nevada desert that's what he used to like to do build jet cars and race them you know and he, and he was into all sorts of homemade projects and so in that sense he was the ultimate sort of maverick scientist but extremely brilliant who arguably they would want to get on board so the whole issue with Teller the fact that he's in the Los Alamos phone directory as working on classified programs, etc., that, for me, has to leave open, you know, or at least strongly suggest, if not even more than that, that he really did work out at S4. But isn't it true that many people that have worked on classified projects that have started to spill the beans or not, you know, they, they end up having... Uh, unfortunate and untimely death? Well, that's true, but I mean, that's the whole reason why Lazar said after somebody tried to shoot his tires out and possibly even kill him and failed, that he decided to go public. And that's one of the things that, you know, is sort of different between Lazar and possibly other people that, you know, they hid in the shadows and then something happened to them. If you present yourself wide open and to everybody, and then you become more and more difficult to take out because everybody knows who you are everybody's watching you and if something happens to you then everybody knows that as well and that really adds weight to your story so you know i think lazar took the approach that the more publicly visible i am the less that's likely to happen and of course you know with a controversial subject like ufos i think the government probably felt quite safe because they knew a significant portion of the, of the population and the media whether his story is true or not, immediately anyway they were going to dismiss it as nonsense. You know, unfortunately, that's how it goes. So, you know, it's, the government has that, the ridicule factor already in its favor that a significant body of people just don't believe in UFOs. So if somebody goes public, you know, a, a, a large number of people aren't even going to listen in the first place. Well, and then, you know, the other outcome with going public is that your reputation is basically ruined, and so getting a job somewhere else is not going to happen. And so now you're working at Walmart collecting carts. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there is that. But, I mean, the thing that Lazar had in his favor, you know, that he he did a lot of sort of self-employed and subcontract work and, um, you know, had these little projects going on where he would, you know, be hired by this company or that company. You know, it wasn't like he was you know, a full-time employee of the Department of Defense or something who got fired and then lost his pension or whatever. You know, he was like a man for hire, so to speak. So he maybe has... I mean, what what is going... Anybody heard from him in the yeah, last I mean, he still, 10, 15 he still surfaces, years? Well, yeah, I mean, he still has his own company that does a lot of sort of advanced um, research, you know, and... Um, sells various products, I think. He, I mean, he has a website. I think, I don't know what he, if it's just boblazar.com or something like that. But, um, you know, where you can contact him. He has his own business, you know. I mean, we all have to live, and Lazar does. But, I mean, you know, he's certainly been out the public eye for a long time, put it that way. Um, but in terms of, you know, losing his job at Area 51, I mean, that was sort of, you know, that was just part of the of his career. I mean, he didn't get the job there till like '88, but he was working at Los Alamos in '82. You know, so he'd all he had a lengthy working career before that. I think he was born in '58, so you know he would have if he left college or whatever at 21, 22. That means he would have been working since 1980, almost a full decade before he got the job at Area 51. You know, so he's somebody who has had regular work. Aside, I mean, people think he worked there for years. He didn't. It was like weeks or possibly, you know, six weeks, seven weeks maybe. And he was, and he wasn't full time there. You know, he was shuttled back in and out. So he spent, you know, a very short amount of time actually in that particular job. Hmm. Interesting. Let, let's move on because there's another underground base that I want to talk to you about, and that's the one in Dulce, New Mexico. Hmm. I have been hearing a lot about um, – you know, a big hangar being there, all kinds of mm. weird stuff going on there. What have you heard? Uh, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, Dulce, New Mexico. Dulce is this small town in northern New Mexico, and it's dominated by this huge mesa called the Archuleta Mesa. And for literally for about 30 years now, there have been long-standing rumors that there's some sort of hollowed-out, vast installation deep inside the mesa itself. Now, contrary to a lot of, a lot of people think, you know, this is some sort of huge government-controlled installation, that's not what the rumor mill suggests. The rumor mill suggests it's actually like a very ancient, I mean seriously ancient, hollowed out cavernous area which is sort of inhabited by and controlled by hostile aliens, extraterrestrials. And reportedly, as the rumors further suggest, um, not only, you know, the general public or whoever not given access to it, but, you know, this, this term keep out applies to the government as well, that the government is sort of fearful of going there even because they've lost control of whatever's going on under there. Now, of course, you know, that sounds like the perfect plot for some, you know, sci-fi movie or the X-Files, you know, aliens controlling an underground base and the government doesn't know what to do about it, etc. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's just nonsense. It, it just cannot be. But when we look into the history of the area, it, it's literally steeped in weirdness. And I'll give you a couple of examples. <laughs> If we, we can go right back to the mid-1960s, sort of a full 15 years before the alien base stories even began to surface at the end of the 70s. In the 1960s, the Department of Energy set up a project called uh, Operation Gas Buggy, and the idea was to re um, release um, very powerful explosive devices deep underground, and the idea was to detonate underground and, and provoke the release of natural gas, which the Department of Energy that could then, you know, use as a, as a form of energy across the United States. You know, there'd be a good, massive amount of natural gas supply. Well, one of these explosions was actually undertaken deep underground, only a few miles from Dulce in 1967. And if you go to this particular area just outside Dulce where this explosion occurred, it was a, you know, if you, if, you, if you Google Operation Gas Buggy, you'll find all the information. Um, but if you go to that area now, there are government signs all over the place warning you under no circumstances to dig deep underground. So, you know, it's interesting that we have these rumors about an alien base at Dulce, and there are government posters and stands and signs everywhere saying under no circumstances will you dig underground in this area. Uh, you know, I mean, it's literally illegal to dig underground. But, you know, that's how you know, sort of remarkable this, this story. It's illegal to dig underground just a couple of miles from Dulce. Um, and so some people in the research field have suggested, well, what if the gas buggy natural gas explosion story was a cover and what the government actually did was sort of to detonate a very powerful device to try and destroy this alien base? And See, that's I heard why, that one. Yeah, and maybe that's why they're warning people not to dig underground for fear that if they dig down too far, you know, they're going to stumble upon sort of entrance points and, you know, cavernous areas and and blow the whole thing wide open. Now, on top of that, just a few years ago, the FBI released, through the terms of the Freedom of Information Act, its entire cattle mutilation file. From 1974 to 1980, the FBI launched a pretty intense study and collection of data on cattle mutilations all across the U.S. But now those files have been released, we can see that from 75 to 79, most of the reports that the FBI analyzed actually came from Dulce. Um, and these talk about animals being drained of blood, organs removed, of strange pod-like landing marks all around the cattle, um, of strange lights in the sky, military helicopters and black helicopters buzzing these mutilation sites, all sorts of stuff. Um, and this is all in the official FBI files. And if you go to their official website, The Vault, you can actually down the FBI, uh, download the FBI's files in, in PDF format now. But these were all on file, you know, back in the mid-70s, again, long before the underground base story started. And, but they began sort of 1979-ish with a man named Paul Benowitz who lived on the, or worked, I should say, at a company called Thunder Laboratories on the fringes of Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. And he began digging into top-secret projects there, which he believed were associated with UFO encounters and UFO technology. And he began to hear rumors about this so-called alien base at Dulce, uh, where there was sort of 
allegedly all sorts of weird genetic experiments going on with sort of captured people, you know, um, gene splicing experiments with animals and all sorts of strange stuff. He sounded like some sort of weird Frankenstein monster type scenario. And the actually some of these stories came to Benowitz from insider sources at, at um, Kirtland at the airbase. But it got um, Benowitz into such a state of worry and concern that he had pretty much after like five years of being pummeled with all these stories and fearful of for his life because he was, you know, uncovered all this information. He almost had like a complete breakdown. Uh, or he actually he did have a breakdown and had to sort of leave the subject and never really fully recovered from it. Um, and some people wonder, you know, what was at least part of the reason for feeding him all this story to provoke the exact reaction that happened, you know, that he was, he just ended up a nervous wreck. But that is sort of the, the background. And, and since then, you know, the stories have developed with other military people coming forward, talking about the base, talk about how many levels supposedly you know multi levels it has like seven eight levels um and and even to this day you know people report seeing weird lights like orbs and helicopters flying around the mountain there even a couple of photographs that seem to show um like shafts and you know air shafts that sort of thing so uh, you know i don't think with all the history and the weirdness we know that's gone on i don't think we can rule out at all that there's something underground in that area somewhere maybe it's not entirely under the the mesa maybe it's you know near it and perhaps some of the stories that it's directly under the mesa are kind of fake ones you know to steer people away from the real location of you know when they've uncovered something but i think there's a good argument for saying there's something in and around that area somewhere are there other underground facilities that have a similar similar reputation of having you know potentially aliens down there or other really weird stuff going on? Well, yeah, I mean, actually Mount Shasta in California, um, that has a story, not so much of like a deep alien base, but the story is that supposedly deep within inside Mount Shasta, there are like massive natural caverns and caves if people knew where to find them. And there are a lot of stories about like sort of ancient, ter- actually ancient terrestrial races um, you know, living within them. Um, you know, people talk about sort of offshoots of the human race that come and came and went, you know, like Neanderthal man, etc., Cro Magnon man. And, you know, some people have suggested maybe there was something, or there is something similar to that, still surviving deep within the caves and caverns of um, Mount Shasta. Kind of like if people have read or, the book or seen the film of H.G. Wells's um, The Time Machine, which goes far into the Earth's future, and there are these sort of devolved humanoid creatures known as the Morlocks that live deep underground in the caves. And it's kind of like that, you know, we're talking about sort of devolved savage humans, or some people talk about highly advanced human-like creatures as well in the, sh- in the caves of Mount Shasta. So that's, you know, that's just one, but there are a number around the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, you know, that have folklore of sort of advanced beings, whether from here or somewhere else, you know, living way underground. But see, that gives, like, Mount Shasta the trifecta, because don't they have Bigfoot? And now you're talking oh, yeah. about a potentially advanced race of beings, and they have UFO sightings. So they yep, have, they have, like, the trifecta of, like, weird stuff. <laughs> well, they have more than that. I mean, they have Bigfoot sightings, they have UFO encounters. Uh, of course, Mount Shasta is in the Cascade Mountains, and it was at Mount Rainier in the Cascade Mountains that Kenneth Arnold had his famous Flying Saucer sighting in 1947. On top of that, um, a lot of the legends about Atlantis su- suggest that some of the surviving people from Atlantis, wherever that might have been, um, supposedly made their way to Mount Shasta as well. So you have a lot of strange stuff all focused on that one particular area. And even the Native American Indian legends, they tell of like a battle between the gods above Mount Shasta as well. So, you know, there's a lot of of strange stuff associated with it. I know there are some people that would say, ah, they've been smoking too much weed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, even if they had been, that doesn't necessarily mean it's still not going on. You know what I mean? (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to throw something out here that I was... So recently, and I don't know if you saw this, and it's okay if you say no, but I would just like your opinion if you did see it. There was a show aired on Animal Planet about mermaids. You know, so you're like, a, you know, crypto guy, yeah. UFO, weird stuff guy. 
Did you see that show? Yes, I did. So other than all over the Internet, it says fake, fake, and the video mm-hmm. that they had of the kids walking out on the beach, I mean, we thought that was fake. What did you yeah. think of that show, and do you think that there's any truth to what they talked about? Well, I mean, the, the show was a spoof. I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but, it, you know, when it aired in America, that wasn't the first time the show aired. It aired, I think, it was something like, I think, six months ago, or maybe longer or shorter, in Australia. And all the people, you know, were, were clearly present, were, were shown at the time when it first surfaced, that they were actors. So it was a spoof. But the thing that got a lot of people confused is that when it aired on American TV, it wasn't shown clearly that it was a spoof. You know, in other words, it wasn't... I, I, don't, I don't think anybody meant to deceive anybody with that show, but it was like people took it literally and assumed it was real, or then when they saw some of the footage and it, and it did look like CGI stuff, they thought, well, hang on, you know, this doesn't look exactly real. And so they got confused. But had it been presented or announced beforehand, you know, that, well, this is a hypothetical look at, at what it could be or how, you know, things could be if the military or the government knows something about mermaids and has kept it secret, this is how it might have played out. But it wasn't presented like that. It came across like a documentary. But people thought, well, hang on, there are bits in it that don't seem documentary-like. They look recreated, so what's going on? Um, so it had a lot of people confused, but I don't think... I mean, I don't personally believe it was a deliberate deception because, as I said, it aired previously to the American airing, you know, so there was no big secret if people looked into the background of it. So I think, you know, it was... I think it was made to get people thinking about the idea that, you know, perhaps what if mermaids are real and the government's hiding the truth. Um, you know, they're actually, in saying that, although, you know, I thought, it, I thought it was an entertaining thing because I actually knew the background to it already. You know, so I knew it wasn't something that was like a big revelation, that it was like a, a thought-provoking what-if type thing. Um, but the interesting thing is that within cryptozoology, there are a number of stories which actually stretch back more than a century of supposedly... Mer- when I say mermaids, you know, we're not talking about sort of the hot-looking woman who's half woman and half fish, you know. Um, that's sort of the artistic imagery that people have, um, you know, that's in the, in the same way that people talk about fairies as, you know, little beings with wings, you know. If you look back at the original legends, they were more like menacing little goblin-type creatures. But, and it's the same with mermaids. A lot of the reports talk about sort of a humanoid being that's sort of but aquatic, that has developed aquatic tendencies like flippers and gills and scales, but has an, a humanoid appearance, but is closer to something like the creature from the Black Lagoon than, you know, um, when Daryl Hannah played the mermaid in the film Mermaid, you know. Um, of course, we all wish mermaids looked like that, but unfortunately they don't, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, the, I mean, the reality, if there is any reality to this, you know, a lot of it is folklore and myth, of course, but a lot of the original stories were of creatures that, you know, look more like a, I don't know, like an amphibian man or something like that. Um, so, you know, I don't think we can ever rule out the, the idea that the government has, you know, acquired whether you know, something out the sea or on the land. You know, there are stories about government coming across Bigfoot bodies and and confiscating them. Now, of course, people say, well, why would the government, you know, hide the truth about Bigfoot? You know, why would that be a conspiracy? You know, it's not like they would hide the body of a gorilla, so why a Bigfoot? One of the theories is that if Bigfoot is sort of semi-human or a primitive humanoid creature and it lives in the forests, then arguably it could have legal status and one of the things it's actually been dressed addressed at an official level is that if bigfoot is shown to be some sort of human and lives in the forest and has some sort of legal right there then it could actually bring to a complete grinding halt in certain whole swathes of the u.s that the logging companies you know their ability to chop down trees because it would possibly become even illegal you know there could be a clause so that's one of the reasons why it's been suggested there could be a big Bigfoot cover-up because it would have an effect on on the economy and the logging industry because these creatures would have a legal, as humans, if you like, right to be there, which sounds strange, but there is a precedent for that. And so 
you know, maybe that applies to some of these other so-called cryptids, these weird animals that, you know, that they're being covered up, not just because they exist, but because there's like a spin-off angle um, as to as to why the secret is hidden, if you like. But why cover up something like a chupacabra? I mean, it's going around killing stuff. Mm. I mean, you would think that if you got it, it would make sense to say, hey, we found this thing, mm. you know, and it used to live in, you know, in this wooded mm. area. I mean, I can understand from, like, an endangered species mm. idea. You know, we're killing their natural habitat, so it's coming out yeah. into our well, area. Well, I think part of the reason is, you know, that, I mean, some of these creatures, for me, they don't come across like just normal animals that science hasn't found yet. I mean, there have been a lot of reports where Bigfoot's been seen in the same vicinity and at the same time as UFOs. You know, so I often wonder if part of the reason for these stories about government cover-ups relate to the fact that maybe there are people in government that know that Bigfoot isn't just an animal that science hasn't found yet, that it could open the doors to another mystery they don't want to know us about us to know about, like UFOs, you know, it may be that they're not so bothered about us knowing about Bigfoot, providing we don't make the connection with the stuff they do want to keep quiet, you know, so I think that's a possibility that um, these creatures aren't just animals that science or, you know, zoology has, hasn't found yet, that they could be, you know, something stranger, possibly. So as opposed to being little gray men with big eyes, it's just, you know, busloads of Wookiees running around? <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things that there's been, a, you know, an observation, and, it, and it's true, people think that if, you know, you've got this big, hairy, ape-like creature, it's got to be dumb and stupid. But what if what if that's just the way they look? You know, we're sort of, you know, we, we, we just, we don't have much hair on our arms or, or legs or whatever, you know, and it's just skin. But what um, we think that an animal with large fangs and covered in hair is, sort of hostile, violent, and not particularly clever. But what if, you know, appearances are deceiving? You know, the fact of the matter is, Bigfoot, whatever it is, has skillfully eluded us consistently 100% of the time, forever. You know, it's got to be pretty smart to be able to do that. You know, so in other words, I don't think it's, it is a case of just them hiding the truth about some you know, dumb ape run, running around. Well, not to say that apes are dumb, because, you know, they're, they're clearly not. They're very highly evolved animals. But if Bigfoot's even more evolved, then, you know, that might explain, again, part of the reason for the secrecy, that they're dealing with something that goes beyond just, you know, a, a regular ape of some sort. I mean, that's a really good point. I, you know, there are reports of... <clears throat> excuse me, like giants that have that live in caves and other weird stuff that live in caves, could there be a correlation between some of these anomalous creatures that they find in these cave dwellings and the underground bases and Bigfoot? I mean, could we talking be talking about like one just giant community? Well, yeah, I mean, it could be. I mean, for example, there have been Bigfoot reports around the area of Dulce. Um uh, a guy named Gabe Valdez, who was a police officer, he died a couple of years ago, but uh, he was a police officer who investigated many of the cattle mutilations around the Dulce area for the New Mexico State Police back in the 70s. And he uh, collected a lot of reports of Bigfoot activity around Dulce. Um, you know, you, you often find, interestingly enough, where there's UFO activity and in government installations, we often find Bigfoot reports that have been a number of encounters where sort of patrol units on duty, um, you know, at night in particularly forested areas, you know, where a military base possibly backs onto a forest where the personnel have seen Bigfoot-type creatures and they've been reported officially and, and entered into the station logbook. You know, that's, uh, you know, private so-and-so saw Bigfoot last night, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, in other words, we, I often, well, I don't say often think, I actually do believe that a lot of these different weird things that we think or many people think are totally unconnected. I think they actually are. You know, I think one of the reasons why Bigfoot's so elusive, you know, a lot of people think it's just this ape, but I think there's something to be said that Bigfoot isn't just highly evolved, but possibly is almost like an interdimensional 
thing but it uses portals and doorways to other realms of existence to kind of zip in and out of our reality into other ones like for example quantum physics today is allowing for the existence of multi dimensions and i think with ufos rather than coming all these miles from planet a to planet b you know however many light years if they if they're entities that rather than being literally extraterrestrial but are more extra dimensional that would make a great deal of sense as to why all these different things are sort of here one minute and gone the next minute because they're zipping out zipping in and out of our reality it's kind of like when you're driving down the road in your car and you've got the radio on you tune to one station you don't like it so you turn over to another station you don't like the song you try another and you go through 40 stations well all those 40 stations are playing at once but you can only be tuned in to one at any given time and that's what quantum physics talks about with multi-dimensions, that they're all existing. And if you have the technology to do it, you can jump from one to the other. And I think that's what a lot of these things are. And maybe that explains why certain places like Mount Shasta are sort of like a magnet for all this activity. The reason being that people have suggested there may be sort of natural doorways and portals and window areas. And that's why certain parts of the world seem more mysterious than others because they literally are like a doorway to allow all this weirdness to come through. Good point. Okay, and looking at the clock, uh, we got plenty of time. So what about um, the government base in Denver? Do you think that's an ancient thing, or do you think that that's something that is new? You know, I mean, um, not the about base the at with Denver, the you know, because it's, it's secret. You know, there's not the anything connected, there. <laughs> you're talking about the one connected with the airport story. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. there's not really any base there. Nudge, yeah, nudge, I wink, mean, wink. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I try, and, I try and remain balanced about all these different stories, but, I mean, there's no doubt that the Denver airport story, you know, is a very controversial one. There's this story that supposedly there's some sort of deep underground base below the airport, you know, that'll be used for some sort of, emergency management area in, when some looming disaster that the government thinks is going to happen comes along and there's sort of ties in that you know the people under there are going to sort of orchestrate some sort of new world order or something like that um i don't dispute at all you know i actually believe that there are classified installations all around the world we know they exist you know area 51 is a prime example but the biggest problem i have with the denver airport story is that it's an international airport that caters for mi literally millions of people every year. So if there is a deep underground installation there, why has no one ever seen it being built? You know, why is it that none of the people who built the airport have come along and said, oh, before we, were built, before we built the airport, we were asked to build this huge place below it that extends, you know, like six levels. No one has actually done that. And, and it's not like that even if they decided to add to it after the airport was built... You know, why weren't the local newspapers saying, you know, why are all these cranes and diggers in there digging up, you know, next to runway number five or whatever? You know, why weren't people who taking off in planes seeing loads of digging activity? So so that's one of the things that makes me skeptical of the Denver story, that it's an international airport, you know, and if you're going to build something like this, a huge underground installation, why do we only have people come forward who claim it's there, but no one's ever, ever come forward to say, hey, I, I helped build it, you know? Okay, good point. So, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't want people to think I'm a skeptic of these bases. I'm not. But, I, you know, I have to be balanced, and I think the evidence isn't, as far as I see it at least, in the favor of the Denver one. But, you know, if somebody comes along and says, hey, I did work on it, you know, well, then I'll listen to them. So. Well, but I like your point about, but no one saw them building it. See, I thought there was talk and pictures of this building activity going on, except not really any buildings being built. Oh, yeah. I mean, there have been, I mean, like all airports, you know, there's been additions and rebuildings and things like this. But the big difference is, you know, if they build a new runway at, say, I don't know, um, Newark Airport, or they, you know, add a new building, that's no big deal. That that goes on all the time because air, airports expand to cater for the growing number of passengers. But, you know, people, the, the sheer scale of the allegations in terms of size of what we're talking about that supposedly exists at Denver, 
you know, this would extend far beyond just sort of localized, a localized little bit of digging. You know, we're talking about supposedly some multi-level place that goes deep, way deep under, you know, the airport and that can ha reportedly ha house thousands of people in the event of a national emergency with recycled air and water for months and months. You know, that would be a tremendous operation. That wouldn't be just like adding a new runway or, you know, adding a new control tower or a, a new storage area underground, you know, for people's suitcases or whatever. You know, it would be much bigger. So, And I guess people walking out with little paper cups of dirt and kind of dumping them, you know, <laughs> yeah, innocently kind of over into the that plant bush over there isn't yeah. going to make a big enough hole in the ground very quickly. No, but as I said, I mean, I'm not dismissing these stories, but what I always demand in something like this is that the more controversial the story, we've got to see some proof or some on-the-record testimony, you know, where are the sort of the schematics and the paperwork. If somebody can present us with all that sort of stuff, or talk about it at least, you know, that's far better than just having people say, well, we were told, you know, by a person we can never name that this exists. But Right. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means the stakes are so high. We need stronger evidence. Okay, so any other really cool secret hidden bases that we haven't mm. talked about yet that well, you yeah, want to I share? mean, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think certainly in the U.S. next to Area 51, and yet this one actually got eclipsed, if you like, by Area 51 when it came along or when it was highlighted more. And that's Hangar 18. Hangar 18 is a story that originates at a place called Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at Dayton, Ohio. And for years, well, as far back as 1947, there have been rumors about crashed UFOs and dead alien bodies having been taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and for storage and investigation and autopsies and analysis, etc. Now, Wright-Patterson actually would be the ideal place to take alien bodies and a reptilian craft, if you like. The reason being because it's home to the Air Force's Foreign Technology Division. And to give you an idea of what the FTD does, um, it's basically, you imagine a scenario if um, a Chinese sat spy satellite flies over the U.S. and it malfunctions and crashes uh, on U.S. soil. Like a quick reaction team would go out and recover it, and it would be taken to Wright-Patterson because the guys there would be experts in, you know, determining how advanced the technology is, is it in front of the U.S., is it behind, can the U.S. learn anything from, you know, this acquired technology. So that's why it makes sense to take a UFO and alien bodies there. Now, contrary to a lot of people think, there actually isn't a big hangar, you know, that you can see from the perimeter of Wright-Patterson with a big number 18 <laughs> painted on the side or anything like that. You know, that, that would almost be too good to be true. But hangar 18 is basically... It's a generic term that was made up as a sort of a catch-all term for these stories that supposedly at Wright-Patterson there's a series of underground vaults. Not actually supposedly that deep underground, only like about 20 feet, but reinforced by thick concrete. But these sort of very long and winding vaults where reportedly a number of alien bodies and alien wreckage, not necessarily full UFOs, but sort of the wreckage, you know, the materials are stored and military people have been down there have talked about seeing you know these bodies laid out in row after row in like cryogenic tanks to preserve the bodies and that you know every so often they'll get a new scientist in to try and analyze them who might be able to answer a few more questions about them and and then in the meantime you know they go back into cold storage until we can learn something else from them and and a number of well, I say a number I mean dozens of people have come forward now talking about having allegedly seen, you know, these bodies deep below, uh, or not actually so, quite so deep below Wright-Patterson. One of the people who was fascinated by all these stories and who had a personal, very deep interest in UFOs and crashed UFOs uh, was the late Senator Barry Goldwater, um, and, you know, one of the most famous people, certainly in the U.S. government and U.S. politics of the last few decades, um, certainly, you know, go back, going back to the 50s. Um, and he had a friend, uh, General Curtis LeMay, and Goldwater said to him, you know, you know I'm interested in UFOs, and you know that I know all the rooms about what's supposedly stored under Wright-Patterson. Can you get me clearance to see what it is, what you've got stored? And even though LeMay was one of his closest friends, he said to Goldwater, 
not only no, but hell no, and don't ever ask me again. And Goldwater, you know, recognising the need for secrecy and security, didn't bring it up with him again. But that sort of kind of shows there clearly seems to be something under there. But more importantly, it also demonstrates that even people like Goldwater didn't have clearance to see whatever it was. So, you know, this demonstrates how tightly the secrecy is held and, and why it's been so successfully held, because just because you're in government or the CIA or whoever doesn't mean you're going to have suddenly the doors are going to fly wide open to you and, you know, you're told all the secrets of Roswell or whatever. I always find that interesting. I mean, now that Roswell is, you know, 1947, mm. and many of the people that were involved with that scenario are older and dying, mm. you know, we're starting to get these deathbed-type confessions mm. that, you know, people, I don't know, some people take them as true. Some people are like, well, it's an old guy, you know. Yeah. So, But we're not even going to – let's not even talk about Roswell. You know, when we bring it even a little more contemporary where there's much more understanding, you know, just even from TV about UFOs and aliens and people have more of a understanding of what they're potentially seeing, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be interesting, you know, people that did work for the government that maybe will start – continue doing these deathbed confessions mm-hmm. – and and sharing information that they have held classified, you know, for 20, 30, 40 years. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, a lot of people, certainly back in the 40s and 50s, you know, if you were sort of 22 years old, you know, I mean, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the guys who reportedly recovered the Roswell wreckage, whatever it was, you know, it's not like they were like majors and generals. You know, they were just the the enlisted personnel. You know, and so if you're 20 years old and you're scooping up this weird wreckage from the floor of Roswell and some general comes along and says you know if you talk about this you'll lose every pension you've got you know we'll just come down on you you can well understand why people were frightened to speak out and you could also understand why they might well wait 50 years you know till they're old or whatever and possibly didn't have long left and then they decided to go public so you know I don't write these stories off deathbed confessions as like friend of a friend or folklore type things, I think it actually makes a lot of plausible sense because it's like, well, if somebody's on their last legs, what can the government do anyway? And it's not like probably the person can prove it. You know, they, it's not like they've got a piece of alien wreckage or a, you know, a piece of the alien's uniform or whatever tucked away, you know, although there are rumors along to those sort of effects. But um, for the most part, a person has a story. Um and I think that's one of the reasons why the government doesn't get in too much of a panic when, even when high-level personnel start talking about Roswell, because I think, and this unfortunately, I have to admit, doesn't help my position, but I will admit it, you know, I think the government, whatever happened at Roswell, they have the secrets so tightly locked up and all the evidence that they really don't care if people write books and talk about it because they know, short of a miracle, we're never going to be able to prove it because the files are tightly locked away the wreckage whatever you know is out of everybody's hands etc and and so it's like well you know try and prove it to us you know and um the government has that stance i think you think this happened at roswell well prove it how are you going to prove it well when we've got everything tucked away i think that's the approach to a lot of these crash stories that you know if if the stories are true then i think the government is unfortunately for us, very safe and secure because it's it's got everything tightly locked away. I think on that note, note we're going to go take a short commercial break, and okay. when we come back, let's talk about some of the ancient secrets that are 